I had lived in the state of Utah for more than 15 years before moving here to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, along with many Jews, Muslims, and Christians. I also found a strong Mormon presence here. For example, this is the Jerusalem campus of Brigham Young University. This is Greg Gifford. I met him while he was touring the country. Greg is a generational Mormon and a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. To me, the Book of Mormon is a beautiful book. I love reading the Book of Mormon. All of Christianity could be likened to an elementary education. I believe that Mormonism is kind of the high school education. We just have more information than Christians. Greg agreed to get together at my Jerusalem apartment to have a discussion about the prophecies of both Mormon and biblical prophets. We begin our conversation focused on the test of a prophet found in the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18.21 asks a question, How can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Would you consider that to be an important question to ask? Oh, absolutely. And that why? So, that's the difference between a man speaking and the Lord speaking. The next verse answers this question. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. What is it that would cause a prophet to fail the test of a prophet? Whatever the prophet proclaims has to take place or come true, says right there. Which makes sense, right? Because by nature, God is the only one that knows the future. You and I both don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes. It's a brilliant and very logical test, isn't it? Yeah. A prophet is someone who claims God is speaking through them. So how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? The answer is the test of a prophet. Here's how it works. Since only God knows the future, people can test a prophet by how accurately he predicts the future. If even one of his predictions does not take place or come true, that prophet fails the test. And if a prophet fails, then God commands the people to put him to death and to not be afraid of him. The introduction page to the Book of Mormon reads, The book was written by many ancient prophets, by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. By the spirit of prophecy and revelation then we should be able to test. We should be able to take this Deuteronomy 18 simple test and apply it to Mormon prophets, correct? Correct. And we should be able to take that simple test. And to be fair, we should also apply it to biblical prophets. Mm -hmm. So are you willing to do that? Yeah, let's do it. The first prophet we will test is the Book of Mormon prophet Nephi. One of his prophecies is summarized by the Mormon church under the chapter heading of 1 Nephi chapter 13. Here Nephi is predicting the loss of many plain and precious parts of the Bible, causing a need for the restoration of the gospel, the coming forth of Latter-day Scripture. So you would agree then that Christianity is, is based on the Old and the New Testament alone as scripture. And then Mormonism is saying, well, no, there's a problem with the Bible. It's been corrupted. This is the restoration of that corruption. And so these books you need to take in an account and to addition to the, to the Bible? Yes. 
So this is what you would trust in as as a Bible. Would you would it be like this? Would it be the Bible first and then Mormon scripture? Uh, well, it's been corrupted, so it's got to be this way. It's got to be that way, okay. Yeah. In the Book of Mormon, the prophet Nephi also states, Thou fool that shall say a Bible, we have got a Bible, and we need no more Bible. So do you think that as a Christian, I'm a fool for believing in the Bible alone? I, I do. Really? The notes at the bottom of the page claim that this prophecy was given between 600 and 592 B.C. At this time, the Mormon prophet Nephi prophesied that after the twelve apostles of the Lamb would come the formation of that great and abominable church. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious. So around 600 B.C., Nephi prophesied that after the twelve apostles of Jesus, the abominable church, which refers to the early Christian church, would corrupt the Bible. So let me make sure that I get this absolutely straight. Here's the Bible that I use as a Christian. What, what chapter 13 is saying is that plain and precious portions went missing from my Bible. That's basically what our whole religion is based on, is that there's a lot of plain and, ple plain and precious truths that have been removed from the Bible. Because of these things which are taken away out of the gospel of the Lamb, Satan hath great power over them. And that great pit which hath been digged for them by that great and abominable church, which was founded by the devil and his children, that he might lead away the souls of men down to hell. So is the Book of Mormon saying that because of this corruption of the Bible, those who follow this corrupted Bible uh, would end up in hell? Yes. So to test Nephi's prophecy, I talked to Greek linguist Dr. Christoph Rico because he is an expert on the reliability of the Bible. Nephi is, uh, according to Mormonism, is a, a prophet. And he is prophesying, if you, if you look at the notes here, between 600 and 592 B.C., so this is a prediction of the distant future. Well, the first thing is uh, I won't find any scholar who would take seriously uh, the, this uh, statement that uh, this prophet is from uh, the years uh, 600 and 592 before Christ. The first question I would ask, uh, or the first demand I would ask, is that they produce a single manuscript of, these, uh, of this prophet. I mean, uh, there is nothing, uh, there is not a single manuscript, either from antiquity or even from the Middle Ages, that they could produce. So this is a text that has been written uh, in modern times. I mean, there's, there's nothing uh, more that can be said about it. Are there any ancient copies of the Book of Mormon that would predate the time of Joseph Smith? No. Not here on earth, anyway. But what happened was the gold plates were given to Joseph Smith. He copied them, he translated from them, and then the gold plates were taken back into heaven. Okay. Um, you know, tomorrow I can come and I say, look, I have had a revelation from heaven, and uh, this is the holy book, and all the, the, all the other stuff is, stuff is nonsense. I can do that. So... Uh, the only, the only guarantor of it is me. Uh, w what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. So there are no ancient manuscripts to back up the prophecy of Nephi about the loss of many plain and precious parts of the Bible. In my conversation with Greg, he explained to me what the Mormon church had taught him about how this corruption of the Bible occurred. Well, it's always been my understanding that there has been one manuscript and as it faded over time, then monks would recopy it 
over and over and over again as the manuscript would fade then they'd create a new one with new ink and if they didn't like the way something read or if they thought it was too controversial they'd just leave it out. Isn't it the case that in antiquity um, the way that the Bible was preserved was that there was only one copy of the Bible and that that copy faded over time and then as it faded they would make another copy of it by copying it over but just one copy at a time? Not at all, not at all. The situation is completely different. What you do have in antiquity is first of all the church start uh, spreading over uh, the Roman Empire and other parts. So uh, everywhere they need copies. So at the very beginning, you, what you need is copies, copies of the New Testament, copies of the New Testament, because... So they there made is... thousands of copies. Of course. Well, I, I understand after having been here and visited that there are literally thousands of manuscripts. People would go places and want to take their scriptures with them, so they would copy down from another manuscript. and whole bunches of people would do that, so there's literally thousands. We have uh, like 6,000 uh, copies uh, of, uh, that, 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 that go back to antiquity that are either in Hebrew for the Old Testament or in Greek for the New Testament. If we are talking about the versions, we are, we, we, the, the figure is much higher. We have 40,000 copies. So, which is something am amazing. You don't have a single other book in antiquity where you have so many, uh, so many texts. So let me get this straight. The Book of Mormon has zero ancient manuscripts to back it up. Yet, it is criticizing the Bible of being unreliable, when the Bible has 40,000 ancient manuscripts to support it. If that were to happen, over and over again that monks didn't like something so they would take it out of the New Testament. With all that you have with the different translations and all the fragments and all the copies that you have, would you be able to determine that that happened? Impossible. This is impossible because soon after the original writings of the New Testament, thousands of copies were made. So if a monk wanted to make a change, his change would stand out like a sore thumb. This is also true for the Old Testament, but these copies are actually older than when Nephi says the corruption of the Bible took place. So, being here in Israel, um, we can test our modern Bibles with what's been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I met up with Dead Sea Scroll expert Dr. Randall Price, who is excavating at Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So again, Nephi prophesied that the Bible would be corrupted after the Twelve Apostles of Jesus. And because the Dead Sea Scrolls are older than this predicted corruption, we can compare the Dead Sea Scrolls with our modern Bibles to see if any plain and precious portions are missing. This is cave one. This is where the first discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was made. So the, the plain and precious things were, were missing, this is saying, after the 12 apostles and after the scriptures went to the Gentiles. What does the Dead Sea Scrolls well, say about that? Because that would predate yeah, that. Yeah, right? obviously this is before Jesus' uh, birth, before the birth of the church, they were hidden away, not discovered for 2,000 years after. So it gives us a chance to look at a history before any of this became controversy or any possible changes could have been introduced. And it tells us that the texts remain unchanged. 
There's nothing different between it and the translation from which our modern Bibles come. So there's nothing missing. Are these plain and precious portions missing from the New Testament? Look, when we are talking uh, about uh, the New Testament, we are talking about the best ever well-known book of antiquity. And uh, the difference between what we know about the, the New Testament and any other book from antiquity is amazing. And so if the reality is as if it is this way, but we can show with the evidence that it hasn't been corrupted, that, that we, have the, we have it preserved in our modern Bibles, then that would nullify that whole need for restoration. In a nutshell. Did that prophecy come true in history? Absolutely not. When we see, when we compare all the ancient copies of the New Testament that we have, the, the differences are very small. So you cannot even show me a text where this has been done because the difference between the different copies that we have are very, very, very tiny. They don't affect the substance of the, of, of the, of the meaning. It is like uh, saying instead of, uh, uh, how can I put it, but saying however. Uh, it is this kind of uh, small and tiny changes. You, you don't have changes that affect the substance of, of, of the meaning of, of the New Testament. So it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that uh, it's uh, utterly impossible. So back to what is being claimed by Nephi in chapter 13, did his prediction that the, that our modern Bibles would become corrupt after the time of the Twelve Apostles of the Lamb, did that come to pass in history? I believe that, well, from what I've been taught as a youngster, yes, it has occurred. And what does the evidence that you find here going and looking at these ancient copies of the Bible tell you in regards to that? That it has not. They're all the same. Then what would the logical conclusion be? Well, it just shows Nephi was wrong when he said, when he made that statement. Since Nephi's prediction that the Bible would be corrupted did not take place in history, he fails the test of a prophet. We can also test the prophets in the Bible. The central theme of the prophecies made by the Old Testament prophets is in the coming of a person, known as the Messiah, someone who would come to save and eventually rule the world. The writers of the New Testament believed that Jesus Christ was this Messiah. In the New Testament, the title Christ has the same meaning as the Old Testament title Messiah. The first biblical prophet we will test is Micah. Around 700 BC, Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Amazingly, a fragment containing Micah's prophecy was discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dr. Price took me to the cave where it was found. What we know is beneath this floor, there were 15,000 fragments that were uncovered. This fragment containing Micah 5.2 dates to 100 BC, making it a century older than the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. In Matthew's Gospel, he states that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. And then he quotes Micah 5.2 to show that Jesus fulfills Micah's prophecy. So there is a link between the prophecy of Micah and then in the New Testament, it is, it is said that he was born in Bethlehem and that he fulfills the, uh, the, that prophecy.
I went to Bethlehem for Christmas, along with crowds of people from all over the world. This is the Church of the Nativity. It's built over the traditional place of Jesus' birth, a site that pilgrims have been visiting for almost 2,000 years. Jewish archaeologist Dr. Gabriel Barkai has been working in Israel for more than 40 years. Listen, I'm uh, very objective. First of all, I'm an archaeologist and I'm not Christian. Where personally do you believe that Jesus was born? Under the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem, there are some caves. And uh, those uh, cavities were in use in the first century, beyond any doubt. For very important places, very significant places in Christian, uh, Christian faith, I would regard the traditional places as authentic. But Mike is not the only prophet who predicted where the Messiah would be born. In the Book of Mormon, the prophet Alma prophesied, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem. You can turn to Alma chapter 7, verse 10. Oh, this is that scripture. <laughs> Book of Mormon is saying that Jesus is born in Jerusalem. Micah is in the Bible is saying that the Messiah is born in Bethlehem. Can they both be right? No. Mormon scholars try to argue that since Bethlehem is so close to Jerusalem, they can be considered the same place. Was Bethlehem part of the land of the Bible? Well, even today, if you go to Bethlehem, you realize it's essentially a suburb. Bethlehem is how far away from Jerusalem? Six miles? Of course it's going to be in the land of Jerusalem. Is this for sure a mistake because Mormon scholars say, well, Bethlehem is close to Jerusalem, so they can be the same. But the historical geographers, in fact, I interviewed a historical geographer and I didn't tell him what the issue was. I just, I just started trying to convince him that Bethlehem and Jerusalem are so close to each other that they, sh they could be considered the same thing. And he treated me like, I didn't know what I was talking about and corrected me. Have you ever heard of uh, Bethlehem being um, described as the land of Jerusalem? It's not the land of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is a city six miles south of Jerusalem. Could you, is there any way that you could say that Bethlehem is, uh, is so close to Jerusalem that you could just call it Jerusalem? No. And there's, there's cities in between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Because Jesus was born in Jerusalem, right? No, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So, historically, have, have you been to Bethlehem? Which one do you think is right historically? Historically, it's Bethlehem. This causes me great angst. I'm, I'd like to say that Alma is a human, <laughs> that he makes mistakes, but... Deuteronomy says that you, in that context, you cannot make mistakes. So I, I, it's hard for me to declare that Alma, well, he obviously made a mistake. So is there any other way to look at that but that that's a mistake? No. So do you think there's any other way to look at this but that this is a mistake? that it's just a mistake. I, I, I don't know what else to say about it. It's, how could you make this mistake? It's, uh... but, but think about it back in our test for a prophet. Is God trying to trick us or does he want us to be protected? He wants us to be protected. So he gives us a simple test, right? Not a complex one. That's and, right. And, and isn't it isn't it something that, that we should test? And, and, and if it fails, isn't it for our protection? 
It is for our protection. The New Testament declares that Micah's prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Since Jesus was not born in Jerusalem, Alma fails the test of a prophet. Next, Greg and I tested the biblical prophet, Isaiah. Around 700 BC, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah made several prophecies about the coming Messiah. One of the most significant was the prediction that the Messiah would come from the ancestry of King David. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness, a man will sit on it, one from the house of David. The oldest copy of this prophecy dates to 125 BC and is preserved in what's known as the Great Isaiah Scroll. It was time for Greg and I to make the climb up to cave number one, where the Great Isaiah Scroll was discovered. But this is literally right here is where they found an entire scroll of Isaiah that dates to 125 BC. Wow. I got to see the actual great Isaiah scroll because it was on display to the public for three months last year for the 60th anniversary. They brought it out and displayed it. discovery like this is do you have anything like this in Mormonism for the Book of Mormon or any Mormon scripture? Not that I know of. Isaiah says that the Messiah will come from the house of David. Do we know that the house of David is real? So the house of David, uh, which is first mentioned in the Bible, but is also mentioned extra-biblical sources, such as the Tel Dan inscription. This is one of two inscriptions that have been found dating to the 9th century BC that specifically mention the historical house of David. The house of David is the family out of which the Messiah is supposed to come. So we have two ancient inscriptions that mention the House of David specifically? Yes, both of them 9th century B.C. And then, and then was Jesus from the House of David? That is the tradition which we have in the, uh, in the um, uh, New Testament. Son of David, what does it mean? He's giving to Jesus a messianic title, Son of David. There is also additional evidence outside of the Bible that Jesus is from the ancestry of King David. Eusebius, an ancient source, reports what happened to the descendants of Jesus' brother Jude at the end of the first century AD. The descendants of Jude were related to Christ himself and they were brought to the emperor, and he asked them if they were descendants of David, and they confessed that they were. This uh, fact is uh, very telling for us because it shows that the family of Jesus was the family of the heirs of King David. So Jesus was the heir of King David. So when in the, mm. at, the, at the cross, you have a, a, a title which is uh, nailed uh, uh, under the cross or uh, upon the cross, we don't know, where it was written, Jesus uh, from Nazareth, King of the Jews. This has a very serious meaning. Hmm. He's the son of David. 
So there is both biblical and extra-biblical evidence that Jesus fulfills Isaiah's prophecy that the Messiah would come from the house of David. Then Greg and I went from a prophecy about King David to a prophecy that King David himself gave. King David's prophecies about the coming Messiah are in the book of Psalm, including one that predicts details about the Messiah's death. They have pierced my hands and my feet. A fragment containing this prophecy was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have found a fragment of that psalm beside the Dead Sea uh, that uh, reads or translates, they have pierced, pierced my hands and my feet. An obvious form of execution that pierced the hands and feet of the victim was Roman crucifixion. There is strong evidence that the Romans crucified their prisoners by nailing them, hands and feet, to crosses. Do we have any archaeological evidence that people were crucified by being nailed to crosses? Yes, there was found a bone box, an ashuri, and inside it there were found the bones of one individual. He ended his uh, life upon the cross. His heel bones were found with the nails still inside them. It proves beyond any doubt the practice of crucifixion there's also literary evidence outside of the Bible that people were nailed to crosses. The first century historian Josephus wrote as an eyewitness that the Roman soldiers amused themselves by nailing their prisoners in different postures, and so great was their number that space could not be found for the crosses, nor crosses for the bodies. Incredibly, Josephus also wrote about the crucifixion of Jesus. Now there was about this time Jesus, and Pilate had condemned him to the cross. I joined the crowds in the streets of Jerusalem on Good Friday as they commemorated the crucifixion of Jesus, an event that took place almost 2,000 years ago. In the New Testament, the eyewitnesses to Jesus' crucifixion wrote about the nail marks in his hands. The Greek word that, is, uh, that, that appears there is precisely uh, nail. So uh, Jesus was really nailed. Uh, and, uh, and also you have uh, in the book of Acts, it is uh, clearly said, and the word uh, that you have in Greek uh, clearly says that uh, Jesus was nailed. So uh, you see, Jesus was nailed to the cross and this uh, fulfills that prophecy of Psalm uh, 22 where it is said that they have pierced my hands and my feet. David's prophecy that the Messiah would die by having his hands and feet pierced is preserved in a Dead Sea Scroll fragment that is over a hundred years older than when Jesus was nailed to a cross through his hands and his feet. Next, Greg and I tested the biblical prophet Daniel. The Old Testament prophets not only give us detailed information about how the Messiah would die, but the prophet Daniel even predicts when. Daniel predicted that the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Cut off is an Old Testament term meaning killed. The city referred to here is Jerusalem, and its sanctuary is the temple. 
So in about 538 BC, Daniel predicted a significant sequence of events. He predicted first that the Messiah would be killed, and then the temple in Jerusalem destroyed. We know in history that from Daniel until today, the only time that the temple was destroyed was in 70 AD. So in order for Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled, the Messiah would have to be killed before 70 AD. This is precisely when Jesus was crucified. After Jesus was crucified, is it true that Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed? Crucifixion took place in Jerusalem around the year 33 of the Common Era. In the year 70 of the Common Era, the temple got burned down by the soldiers of Titus. Titus and his army, his engineering forces, intentionally ruined the entire city of Jerusalem as well as uh, the uh, focal point of Jerusalem, that's the Temple Mount. There's no question, right, that the, that the writings of Daniel, including that particular prophecy, predate the 70 AD destruction? That's for sure. That's for sure. So the city of Jerusalem and the Temple will be destroyed after the Messiah is cut off. And that's what happened. So just as Daniel predicted, Jesus was killed just before the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed. After his death, Jesus was taken down from the cross and laid in a tomb like this one. This tomb is 2,000 years old, dating back to the time of Jesus. Today, the tomb of Jesus is protected beneath this mass of construction. Well, buried beneath uh, this mass of uh, construction here uh, is the tomb of uh, Jesus. There is a very, very ancient tradition about uh, the, the location of the tomb and uh, the place of crucifixion, which is in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is Dr. Shimon Gibson. He is a secular archaeologist who has personally excavated here in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. If I weigh up all this evidence that I have, the archaeological historical evidence, this has to be the tomb of uh, Jesus. And it's nothing, uh, I'm not swayed by any kind of sort of uh, religious uh, belief here. It's based on archaeological and historical evidence, this has to be the tomb of Jesus. Finally, I showed Greg another prophecy by King David. David not only prophesied about how the Messiah would die, but he goes on to predict that he would not stay in the grave, but would again know the path of life. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. The disciples believed that Jesus was the fulfillment of David's prophecy. Because his body did not decay in the grave, he had risen from the dead. On the third day after Jesus' burial, some of his women followers found his tomb empty. On the, the, the Sunday, uh, following the execution which took place on, on the Friday, uh, the women come uh, to the tomb expecting to see the body of uh, Jesus inside, and they find nothing. It's an empty tomb. I talked with Dr. William Lane Craig, the author of the groundbreaking book, Assessing the New Testament evidence for the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. We have very, very strong literary evidence for the empty tomb, namely the evidence found in the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. In the Gospels, an angel at the empty tomb tells the women, He is not here. He is risen. The original explanation that the disciples themselves, the eyewitnesses gave, was... God raised Jesus from the dead. 
That was the message they proclaimed in Jerusalem and were willing to die for. There is no doubt that the apostles saw Jesus' resurrection as a direct fulfillment of David's prophecy. In fact, the apostle Peter quotes David's prophecy in his sermon and preaches that David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. The contrast was very clear. Whereas David's tomb was there, identifiable, the tomb of Jesus was empty, his body was not to be found, God had raised him up. And so in the sermons of the Acts of the Apostles, we have independent evidence for the empty tomb of Jesus in these apostolic sermons. But the literary evidence even goes beyond the New Testament. Again, the first century historian Josephus, even though he is not a follower of Jesus, still writes of his resurrection. Those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold. We have multiple independent early witnesses to the facts of Jesus' empty tomb, post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And it's on that basis that the majority of New Testament historians have come to believe that these are, uh, in fact, uh, historical pay dirt and belong to the portrait of the historical Jesus that we can reconstruct. When I weigh the historical evidence pertinent to the resurrection of Jesus, and the various competing hypotheses to explain this evidence, then I'm convinced, objectively and honestly, that the best explanation of this evidence is the hypothesis that the original eyewitnesses gave, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And for that reason, I think that this was a historical event. Even today, pilgrims return to the site of Jesus' tomb to celebrate his resurrection, just as they have been doing for almost 2,000 years. Once a year, pilgrims from all over the world pack into the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. A fire is then lit from within his tomb and is spread from candle to candle through the church, then throughout Jerusalem, and then to the ends of the earth. According to the New Testament, Jesus' resurrection clearly fulfilled David's prophecy. In this world, there are over six billion people alive today. But if you want to send a letter to just one person out of those six billion, how much information do you have to put on a letter to do that? Not much. Surprisingly small amount. A few lines of information on a letter can pinpoint one person in the world. In the same way, the details given to us by David, Isaiah, Micah, and Daniel can identify one person out of all the people that have ever lived. Who else in the scope of history was born in Bethlehem from the house of David, pierced hands and feet, killed before the temple was destroyed, and whose tomb was found empty? This is, this is God speaking to us. He really did tell us before he sent his son Jesus, he really did tell us what his plan was before it happened. After applying the Deuteronomy 18 test of a prophet to both Bible and Book of Mormon prophets, it becomes clear that the biblical prophets accurately predicted the future, while the Mormon prophets failed. 
The biblical prophets are surrounded by an abundance of historical evidence. While there's no evidence at all for any of the Book of Mormon prophets. In fact, none of them appear in any written source until the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. These Book of Mormon prophets prophesied of Joseph Smith, the Latter-day Seer, and that the Book of Mormon shall come forth. It shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book. The book shall be delivered unto a man, and he shall deliver the words of the book. Since there are no ancient texts that contain these prophecies, we're simply left with the fact that in 1830, Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon that prophesied that Joseph Smith would publish the Book of Mormon. This is why non-Mormon scholars conclude that the Book of Mormon prophets were created through the imagination of Joseph Smith himself. The only thing that you have is something that has been printed in the 19th century. It has been written by someone in the 19th century and given to print. Okay, uh, I can do the same if you want. You can do the same. You can take you can write, I, Joel, I say that I, uh, now I am uh, the true prophet and uh, the Bible has been corrupted and all the Bible uh, of uh, the Christians is nonsense. And this is the true Bible. And yet, what, what can we say? Who is the witness of that? Who is the, who is the, who is the guarantor, guarantor of what you are saying? Only you, yourself. But Joseph Smith took it a step further by inserting these prophecies about himself and the Book of Mormon into the Bible. Joseph Smith claimed the Bible was not translated correctly, so he did his own translation of the Bible. In it, he inserted prophecies about himself and the coming of the Book of Mormon. This is the new translation of the Bible by Joseph Smith of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is the new translation of the Bible by Joseph Smith of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes. Um, have you ever heard of this? It's the new translation of the Bible by Joseph Smith of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hmm. Joseph Smith's translation is also known as the inspired version. On each page, the column on the left contains the text of Joseph Smith's inspired version, while the column on the right contains the text of the Bible. Throughout Smith's translation, there are multiple pages of additional text that are not found in the Bible. You can see where Joseph Smith's translation goes on and on. Look at these sections in here, I mean, of, of text that, look at that. I mean, we're, we're talking some major some stuff. Some major addition. What's being said here is this is the plain and precious portions that have been lost from the Bible, and this is it being restored by Joseph Smith. And he's talking about corruption of the Bible. Here's Isaiah chapter 29. So we're not talking about a letter here of difference. We're not talking about a few words. We're talking some, some major differences in how much text is in Joseph Smith's Isaiah and our modern Bibles. Gosh. So are you curious what is in this text? Absolutely. Joseph Smith inserted these prophecies about the coming of the Book of Mormon and himself into his translation of Isaiah. It shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book. Smith's Isaiah says the same thing. It shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the words of a book. The book shall be delivered unto a man, and he shall deliver the words of the book. The book shall be delivered unto a man, and he shall deliver the words of the book. But the book shall be delivered unto a man. 
That sounds familiar. And who, what man do you think that's talking about, prophesying about? Uh, Joseph Smith. But the book shall be delivered unto a man, um, and he shall deliver the words of the book. He, he, what he's doing is he's adding prophecies about himself yeah, yeah, and the yeah. Book of Mormon into Isaiah. Three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, and they shall testify to the truth of the book. Three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, and they shall testify to the truth of the book. Three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God. Okay, so is that the same verse as we find over here? Yes, it is. Logically, what, what, is your, what do you think when we compare the Isaiah scroll to Joseph Smith's Isaiah? Do you think that this information about the coming of the Book of Mormon through Joseph Smith and the three witnesses is in it? I'm afraid to say I doubt it. All we need to do to test Joseph Smith's translation of Isaiah is compare it to the great Isaiah scroll. That was some of the early attempts of Mormon scholars to see if the great Isaiah scroll supported a text that Smith had. The fact is it doesn't support uh, his translation. And I think for the most part Mormon scholars have moved away from trying to make that case. Does it, is this an add-on? Yeah. So what does that say about what Joseph Smith did to Isaiah? Well, it sounds like it came from an ordinary man rather than God. And so... So uh, it is not a, a new translation, it is a rewriting of, uh, of, uh, of the Bible. He is rewriting the Bible. A key verse that Joseph Smith rewrote is John 1.1 1, 1, that refers to Jesus as the Word. In the Bible, John 1.1 1, 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But Smith's version reads, In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. By changing was God to was of God, Smith stripped Jesus of his deity. The Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. N not a single scholar could tell you that this is an accurate translation of the Gospel of John. The most ancient copy of the Gospel of John that we have goes back to the year 150, more or less. That is a papyrus, which is called Papyrus 66. We are very sure about the text that we have. This earliest copy we have of John 1.1 is only about 50 years older than when John originally wrote that Jesus was God. As one who personally knew Jesus, John is a more trustworthy witness of who he was, rather than Joseph Smith, who rewrote John's testimony roughly 1,700 years later. And isn't it true that if people take this left side and what Joseph Smith is saying, uh, and if they are persuaded by it to follow that, wouldn't, wouldn't, they, wouldn't truth be corrupted and wouldn't they be led astray? Uh... I mean, they will be reading Joseph Smith, not the Gospel. When you read John 1.1 1, 1 in the Joseph Smith version and John 1.1 1, 1 in the Bible, are those two different Jesuses? Oh yes, completely. Completely. We are talking about something completely different in each case. You can believe in the Jesus, uh, Joseph Smith's Jesus of John 1.1 1, 1, or you can believe in the John 1.1 1, 1 of the New Testament, but you can't believe in both, can you? No, you can't. Joseph Smith also changed Romans 4.16. Here the Apostle Paul declares how men are saved when he writes, Therefore it is of faith, that it might be by grace. But Smith's version reads, Therefore ye are justified of faith and works through grace. Joseph Smith added, and works, to Paul's gospel of which he warned, 
Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. You are justified of faith and works. So he added and works. Yeah. So that... The, 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 the word works is not there. He added and works. He did. And would you say that that gospel that, that includes the works is the gospel message that, that represents Mormonism? Yes. Another revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet was that these works even enable men to become gods. It's my belief that God was uh, like me at one point in time. Do you believe men can become gods? That's what I've been taught. The Apostle Paul preached that by grace, God became a man to save men from their sins. In contrast, Joseph Smith preached that by their works, men can become gods. Interestingly enough, Paul says that anyone who changes the gospel that he preaches is to be eternally condemned. It's Mormonism that's saying corrupting the Bible is a serious, serious problem, right? Correct. But doesn't the evidence show that Joseph Smith is the one that corrupted the Bible? If we're being criticized because we took the plain and precious portions out of the Bible and therefore we're, Satan's got power over us as, as the Book of Mormon says, and that we're being led to hell. If the evidence shows that actually the reverse of that is true and Joseph Smith is the one that changed the Bible, then wouldn't it be his followers and, and the church that he's associated with that are in serious eternal trouble? Hmm. Boy, that's scary. The evidence clearly shows that it is Joseph Smith who corrupted the Bible. In addition to this, Joseph Smith made his own predictions about the future, so he too can be tested. Recorded in Mormon scripture is a revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet that was given in 1832, that a temple shall be built in Missouri. Joseph Smith predicted that the temple shall be reared in this generation, for verily this generation shall not all pass away until a house shall be built unto the Lord. Just over a year later, the Mormons were forced to leave the area and eventually the entire state of Missouri, where the temple was prophesied to be built. Thirty-eight years after the prophecy was given, as Joseph Smith's generation was coming to a close, the Mormon apostle Orson Pratt had not yet given up hope in his prophet when he preached. The Latter-day Saints just as much expect to receive a fulfillment of that promise during the generation that was in existence in 1832 as they expect that the sun will rise and set tomorrow. Why? Because God cannot lie. He will fulfill all His promises. As a follower of Joseph Smith, Paul Trask moved his family to Independence, Missouri, but he lost faith in Joseph Smith as a prophet through failed prophecies like this one. Joseph Smith uh, prophesied in the Doctrine and Covenants that the temple here in Independence would be built in this generation um, as a sign uh, to the people, uh, which prophecy never came to pass. We could go and take a look at the temple lot today and see that it's a completely bare piece of ground with nothing but grass growing on it. 
and uh, we're certainly very far removed from the 1830s when that prophecy was given. So certainly this is, uh, has to go uh, be counted uh, as one of many uh, failed prophecies by Joseph Smith. Do you know of any prophecies that Joseph Smith himself gave that failed? Yeah, I do. Jesus also prophesied about the temple that stood in Jerusalem in his day. His disciples remarked about the massive stones and magnificent buildings that were on top of the temple mount. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Jesus is specifically predicting about the buildings that they would be so thoroughly demolished that not one stone would remain on top of another. Not only this, but all these stones would be thrown down off the Temple Mount platform. Is there any archaeological evidence for the prophecy of Jesus in the destruction of the temple that there wouldn't be one stone on top of another? This is the evidence. This is the, this evidence. Is the evidence. Look at it. Uh, <laughs> it speaks for itself. There is, there is uh, evidence in front of our eyes to the prophecy that came through. Jesus talks about the stones being cast down, and what he's talking about is they would be cast down from the destruction of the buildings off of the platform onto the ground here. Here you have it. And when they were cast down and it struck this, uh, this road that we're sitting on this street, what would have Just been look the impact? At it. If you look at it, there are certain places like here and over there uh, where there are depressions. Uh, this is from the pressure, enormous pressure of these uh, gigantic stone blocks, each of them several tons in weight. Now the ninth of Av, or Tisha B'Av in Hebrew, uh, is uh, traditionally thought to be the date of the destruction of the temple and on that day uh, laments are said for the uh, destruction of Jerusalem and on the eve and the morning of that day uh, they read the book of lamentations. And you may see even people sitting and crying. <laughs> this is an event which took place uh, almost 2,000 years ago, and they still feel it as if it was yesterday. <laughs> Looking at the stones, I can hear the voice of the, the sound of the stones collapsing and breaking the uh, slabs of the street. I can hear the people around shouting. I can hear uh, the, uh, the hussing of the flames uh, around. So uh, with a little bit of imagination, those uh, stones can become uh, even more talkative than they are. Not a single building of Jerusalem was left, and not a stone upon a stone of the temple remained. <laughs> Jesus' prophecy that the Jewish temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed took place in history while Joseph Smith's prediction that the Mormon temple would be built in Missouri did not. So Joseph Smith fails the test of a prophet. Is there any way to look at this other than that he fails the test of Deuteronomy 18? When you 
apply the scripture verbatim, then it does it paints a paints a sorry picture of Joseph. So what does Deuteronomy say your responsibility is? Because it, it's not it's not written to it's written to uh, to the one who's reading it, obviously. And there's there's a responsibility to the if if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. And it says what you're to do with that person, you must be put to death. Ah. Oh. And, and what, that, what, what, what is that responsibility that God is giving in response to the prophet that's found a false prophet? Who's got the responsibility to put that prophet to death? Must be put to death. Well, the people... Uh, God's not going to strike him dead. Yeah, it's to the people who have come to realize uh, this person has failed this test of a prophet. Right. Therefore, it's the people's responsibility to put him to death, right? And so in context to Joseph Smith, we remember that death means separation. So what it means from a spiritual standpoint, a biblical standpoint, to put Joseph Smith to death is to separate ourselves from him and his writings and his church. And that responsibility God has given to the one who sees that he fails the test. Mm. So you're saying that he's failed the test, but you don't want to put him to death. I don't know what to believe anymore. Sometimes I'm, I totally see what you're talking about and it's, I have no fear of Joseph Smith whatsoever. Because again, Deuteronomy 18 says, if a prophet fails a test, do not be afraid of him. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of Joseph Smith. I'm not afraid of being condemned to hell. Because I don't believe that he is a true prophet because he fails a test of a prophet. And therefore I can walk in freedom without having to fear what the Book of Mormon says about me, what it says about the Bible that I believe in, and so on and so forth. This is what I believe. I believe in this alone and I don't believe that it's foolish to do so. Um, this I have a problem with because, because there's so many contradictions between this and this that to believe in all of that logically doesn't work. Then you have to, honestly, you have to add this to the mix too because that's a work of Joseph Smith. This is a work of Joseph Smith. Now you've got a new translation. How can that's just a confusing mess. And there's John 1.1 1, 1 isn't the same as John 1.1 1, 1 in here. And Romans 4.16 isn't the same as Romans 4.16 in here. And Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah isn't the same. And the Torah isn't the same. And then you have this reflected more in this. I just, it's hard for me to grasp how logically you can believe in that whole ball of wax without having what's called cognitive dissonance, which is these contradictory beliefs that that cause great confusion. Yeah. For me to answer your question, it's going to take a lot of study. And I have to come to grips in my own mind as to, I can't just take your word for it. I have to study Absolutely. it out for myself. Absolutely. And let me just end by saying this. If it's simple, Logically, I think it has to be. Because I, I don't believe that God says, He says, you know, to understand His truth, that we've got to be more like children, not more like scholars. Yeah. So bottom line, it's got to be simple. I think He makes it simple for our protection. I think Deuteronomy 18, test of a prophet, is simple for a reason by God's design. It is. And when you apply Deuteronomy 18, that simple test to Joseph Smith and you put him to death, this is what happens.
And I believe that that is where peace is. And where the confusion ceases to, you know, to manipulate into, and to where you can go, okay, now the confusion's gone. Now I can go into what, what the Bible says about what the problem is and what the solution is and how Jesus is that solution, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and really begin to be free. While Greg remains a member of the LDS Church, he made a commitment with me that he would thoroughly study these things out for himself. And I am convinced that anyone who is willing to do the same will fulfill the promise that Jesus made almost 2,000 years ago. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free.